to access uh, credit and to be able to sort of reboot the economy, if you like. Uh, the isolation of the, of the government has continued with uh, uh, the US and the EU and other Western governments maintaining sanctions, or at least what they call uh, restrictive measures on the regime in Harare. Of course, there is support uh, even for the elections that we just came out of. There is support from China, the SADC, the African Union, and other you know, regional and sub-regional bodies that have given the elections a clean bill of health. That support is not translated, of course, to any financial um, uh, support. This is a regime which is uh, uh, desperate for, for, uh, for aid, but uh, none of the governments that have stood with them politically are willing to give the kind of financial backing that is going to be useful in terms of uh, you know, rebooting the economy and making sure that there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, resuscitation. Why focus on the military? I argue that uh, there are very dim prospects for democratization or a democratic transition without talking about security sector reform in Zimbabwe. I think that there's been a complex party state conflation in Zimbabwe with the military uh, taking over the sort of bureaucratic function that you would expect uh, 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 you know, a government to have a professional bureaucracy. Um, I also argue that there has been military control of natural resources, particularly the diamonds. If you talk about the diamond mining concessions uh, in the areas where diamonds are being mined, the military has a very huge presence in those areas. And I, I argue that that presents challenges uh, going forward. I think that uh, the reason why also we need to focus on the military and possibilities of democratic transition or some kind of transition in Zimbabwe is the age of the president. Mr. Mugabe turns 90 uh, in a few weeks' time. And um, you know he's not going to be there forever. Of course, he has demonstrated physical uh, and mental resilience. Uh, but I think that there's a limit to which uh, we are going to have Mr. Mugabe with us. So we ought to start thinking about you know, possibilities going forward. And the role of the military post Mugabe, I think, is going to be critical. I also argue that sufficient attention has not been paid to security sector reform. In particular, if you look at the SADC role uh, in Zimbabwe over the last five years in terms of uh, facilitating political processes uh, through the period of the government of national unity, I think that there wasn't sufficient attention paid to security sector reform to the point that we went to an election uh, without the kind of security sector reform that was going to be necessary uh, to have democratic elections. Uh, you know, I'll talk about uh, briefly, you know, the a history of civil military relations in Zimbabwe. I mean, there is debate uh, even in the academia on uh, whether Mr. Mugabe is in charge of the military or the military is in charge of Mr. Mugabe. Is there objective uh, civilian control uh, or the military has just been given carte blanche uh, to dictate uh, political processes in Zimbabwe? Uh, there are some scholars like Eldred Masunungure and Mike Bratton who have spent some time you know, doing research in Zimbabwe. They talk about a coup by stealth that has happened in Zimbabwe, arguing that uh, the military uh, has, uh, has, has taken over uh, you know, uh, uh, the reins of the state. And therefore, what we have is the facade of a civilian government, but in actual fact, it's the military that's running affairs. You also have other scholars like uh, Oxford scholar Miles Stend who argue that Mugabe is fully in charge, that uh, the 1965, uh, you know, Sikombela declaration during the liberation struggle in which, uh, you know, ZANU-PF or ZANU then, uh, you know, made the point that the military was going to be under the control of the uh, civilian leadership of the party. He argues that it's still very much, uh, you know, in currency and uh, that the military is under civilian control. Of course, that's a debate that's ongoing, but what they all agree is that the military has gone beyond its traditional role of maintaining the territorial integrity of the country and has become involved in political processes. I think that it's difficult to think of uh, you know, Mugabe and ZANU-PF outside of the military because of the complex history of uh, you know, the birth of the current military and other security, uh, state security agencies. This is a a military that's born out of a liberation struggle. These are comrades who were fighting alongside each other. And at independence, when, we, uh, when, when, when they go into government, some of them go into uh, uh, civilian control. The other comrades go into the state security agencies. And, uh, uh, but it's difficult to uh, sort of you know, think of them as a military, professional military outfit. 
of course, in the early days or in the early years, there were efforts to sort of professionalize the army and make sure that, uh, uh, you know, it plays its role. But I think that uh, the liberation struggle history of the 60s and 70s had, had had a profound impact on uh, current uh, civil military relations in Zimbabwe. Uh, the roles of Zanla, Zipra, and the Rhodesian Front. Um, you know, Zanla was the military wing of ZANU, uh, which was predominantly Shona. And uh, Zipra was the military wing of ZAPU, which was predominantly in the Bele, uh, the smaller ethnic grouping in Zimbabwe. Uh, all of these of course, were fighting uh, alongside in some cases, but in most cases, they were fighting as separate units. And that independence, uh, you know, the actual integration into, into one army is a problematic process, and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, the history of the liberation struggle itself, you know, also shapes uh, processes today. It was a history of violent pages, assassinations. You know, you talk about uh, Herbert Chitepo, who was one of the founding uh, leaders of the liberation struggle was assassinated in 1975. Josiah Tongogara, who was uh, also a commander, assassinated in 1979. You also had a history of palace coups even before independence. Mr. Mugabe himself being a beneficiary of uh, one of those palace coups in Damaningi Stole, who was the leader of uh, uh, ZANU, was actually deposed. And uh, Mr. Mugabe eventually took over control of the party. So all of this you know, the military going in and, and, and dictating or at least shaping political processes, it's got, you know, uh, something to do with the history of the liberation struggle. As I mentioned, the integration process in 1980 was a very difficult process. There were mutual suspicions because of the ethnic issues and so forth. Um, again, we begin to see a Zanufication of the military, uh, whereas where, where those from Zanu and Zanla are given positions, uh, higher positions in the professional outfits at the expense of... Uh, uh, the other ethnic groups. Uh, you talk about the creation of the North Korean uh, 5th Brigade, which was an elite uh, military unit which was created uh, in the 80s. And uh, this is a, it, it was very critical in the sense that uh, when we had, uh, you know, uh, uprisings in the southern part of the country, the ethnic Ndebeles uh, resisting attempts by Mr. Mugabe to establish a one-party state uh, the 50th Brigade was deployed to Matebeleland, and uh, about 20,000 ethnic Ndebeles were actually butchered and killed uh, in that uh, civil war. Um, the militarization of the state, I think that there are two, two strands that we have to uh, talk about when we look at the history of how we are where we are today. I think the economic collapse really had an impact on uh, political processes. In the 90s, as I, as I mentioned, uh, particularly mid-90s, going into the late 90s, we begin to see uh, the economy taking a strain. And, uh, uh, you know, in 1997, Mr. Mugabe agrees to award uh, cash gratuities to veterans of the liberation struggle. And uh, that had an impact on the, on the economy. This was, this was unbudgeted for. Uh, you know, and it, I argue that uh, this is the point where Mr. Mugabe demonstrates or betrays his vulnerability to the military, because most of these veterans, uh, some of them were actually serving members of the of the of the military establishment. Um, Black Friday, 14 November 1997, the Zimbabwean dollar loses 70 percent uh, of its value following the awarding of uh, the cash gratuities to the war veterans. Some of you might think that um, you know that was something that. Um, why such a big impact on the economy? Uh, you know, $50,000, Zimbabwean dollars then, uh, for, a for a small economy uh, that Zimbabwe was, really took a toll. And this was money that was not uh, uh, budgeted for. Um, I think we, we also see uh, 1998, 1999, the Zimbabwean military being deployed to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Obviously, for economic and uh, uh, geopolitical interests, that many today question whether uh, that had anything to add uh, or had any value that the, the government of Zimbabwe was deriving. But uh, again, that takes a toll. In fact, some of the economists argue that we were spending close to six, seven million dollars a day in that war. And for a small economy uh, that Zimbabwe was, uh, this really had a huge impact. We, we, some of you might have seen the UN panel of experts report on DRC. It talks about the role of the Zimbabwean military in the plunder and looting of some of the resources, including the diamonds in that country. And some of the military figures that we currently have in the current establishment were actually mentioned in that report as having played a role uh, in, the, in the resource plunder. Um, 
politically, I think that uh, post-colonial Zimbabwe, until about 1999, we have had a de, a de facto one-party state uh, with ZANU-PF firmly in control. But I think that uh, economic collapse and uh, social collapse in the 90s result in a broad social movement which emerged and, uh, you know, their demands for a new constitution as people identify governance issues as being at the center of the, of the economic crisis. Uh, the MDC, you know, emerges in 1999 and challenges for power in 2000. But the first defeat that Mr. Mugabe uh, sort of suffered was uh, uh, February 2000, when we had a national referendum on a constitution uh, that the government was proposing. And uh, under that constitution, Mr. Mugabe would have maintained his uh, imperial powers, his executive authority, and the people of Zimbabwe said no. They wanted a constitution in which Mr. Mugabe's powers would be kept. So uh, the people voted against that constitution. And uh, to me, that marked the turning point in the sense that politically, you begin to see the regime digging in and uh, realizing that opposition is growing. And hence, a culture of violence, a culture of state-sponsored violence uh, became entrenched in the body politics. Um, the military and other state agencies you know, begin to play a very important role. Uh, this is the same period where we begin to see even the farm invasion, what they call the fast track land reform program. And the military was key in terms of uh, logistical uh, planning for the invasions, even though they were touted as you know, farm invasions by landless people. Uh, it was very clear that this was a military strategy. This was a political strategy in which the state security agencies played a very important role in coordinating. Um, the Joint Operations Command, at the time where we are having this uh, uh, economic crisis, particularly you know, in the 2000s, the Joint Operations Command really takes control of uh, uh, public policy issues. It's no longer just, uh, 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 you know, uh, the Joint Operations Command comprises heads of the security agencies, so your police, your military, your air force, and your prisons. Uh, they become a, a, a de facto policy-making unit that, uh, to the point where uh, you know, they have broader veto on uh, public policy issues. And there's also a deployment of uh, serving and retired military personnel to key government institutions. So if you talk about the public media, for instance, you go there, the person who's heading uh, the board of the ZBC would be someone with a military background. If you go to state-owned enterprises like your railways, for instance, uh, you find that the person who's serving there is someone with a military background. If you go to your electoral institution, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, for instance, the person who was heading that unit was someone with a military background. If you go to, uh, um, you know, uh, the Delimitation Commission, which is uh, uh, delimiting constituencies, uh, I think there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, Judge Chueshe. He was the first person to go in and uh, head the delimitation of constituents. So there is an entrenchment of the military in most of the key institutions uh, that have got an impact on uh, political processes. Um, there was also the exclusive promotion of people with military background in key security agencies. So those who are coming in as professional soldiers who go through the training were actually frustrated because you had people who were coming from the military and heading most of these institutions, including your prison service, including your intelligence and all these other uh, state security uh, uh, institutions. Then there is also allocation of prime land. If you look at uh, some of the current uh, heads of the security agencies, these are the people who occupied uh, most of the prime land during what they called the land reform program. Of course, many people will argue that uh, uh, this was uh, um, uh, a ploy by the, by the political elite, including the military, to take access to uh, lucrative land. Again, there is access to lucrative government, con government contracts for uh, companies with uh, links to the military and uh, headed in some instances by people who have come out of the military or who are actually serving in the military. Mining con concessions uh, and things like that. If you go to the diamond mining sectors, for instance, I'll talk about this later on, but you realize that there were a lot of joint ventures. There are a lot of joint venture uh, agreements between uh, uh, military-linked firms and Chinese uh, mining companies. Uh, a culture of violence, intimidation, and looting uh, is also, uh, it, it becomes entrenched. There was what they called government by operation. So the military, uh, as the de facto policy-making unit, was really declaring operations. So for instance, in 2005, we had Operation Murambatrina, where in the military and other state security agencies went in and destroyed people's homes. Uh, ostensibly, you know, to, to, to make sure that Harare was a clean city. But obviously, you know, this was 
uh, an attempt to silence what they consider to be opposition stronghold. Harare, for instance, is considered uh, an opposition stronghold. So Mramba Trina was basically uh, to silence these people. You also had other operations, including Maguta, which was really an I mean, agricultural uh, uh, production operation where the military said, we have given land to the people, they are not producing. So as the military, we are going in to take over the farms and we are going to be producing for the country. Of course, this is disastrous uh, uh, consequences for the economy. You also had other operations, uh, you know, Operation Makafotera Papi and all, and I'll speak to some of those uh, operations uh, later on. I just thought I would bring in a few uh, quotations just to demonstrate the kind of public attitudes, or at least the attitudes of the military in terms of political processes uh, in Zimbabwe. This is a statement that uh, uh, the president made, and I'll give you a few seconds to... Can we all see? Okay. This is another statement by the Joint Operations Command in 2002, just before the election, uh, the presidential election, in which Morgan Changirai, the opposition candidate, participated as a candidate. Okay. This is another statement by Army Chief of Staff, Major General Martin Chedondo, in May 2008. Okay. Again, uh, the same Major General making this statement in May of 2012. I, I put up these quotations because in some cases, you know, some people have argued and said, well, it's normal for, no, for military people to uh, retire and go and serve in government institutions. People have said, well, even in America, you have generals going into uh, civilian leadership. So what's wrong with that happening in Zimbabwe? But when the military goes in and makes public pronouncements and makes statements to the effect that one political party is going to rule, the other political party cannot rule, it's a violation of the Constitution. It's a violation of the Defense Act, because the Defense Act actually says uh, state security agencies are supposed to be apolitical. They are supposed to act impartially, and they are not supposed to demonstrate or publicly declare their support for any political party. Um, I just pulled out a few pictures so that you can see some of the uh, characters. I think this, is, uh, this needs no introduction. This is uh, Commander-in-Chief. Uh, of the Zimbabwe Defense Forces, President Mugabe. This is uh, the Zimbabwe Defense Forces Commander, General Constantine Chiwenga. On his left is the Director General of State Security or Intelligence. Uh, I think it's Major General Epton Bonyongwe. And on the right is uh, uh, the President. On the left, this is uh, the Commissioner General of the Police, uh, Augustine Chihuri. And on his right is... Uh, uh, Defense Forces Commander Chuenga. This is the, the head of the Air Force of Zimbabwe, uh, Air Marshal Perence Shiri. And this is the Commissioner General of Prison Services, Major General Paradise Zimoni. Together they make up uh, uh, what's called the Joint Operations Command. Of course, on paper, uh, it also includes other uh, uh, officers. I'll speak about the Joint Operations Command in particular uh, during the period of the inclusive government and uh, uh, the kind of uh, resistance that was there by the military in terms of reforming some of these institutions. Um, so I think the military has taken a more uh, 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 active role, even in terms of control of political party strategies of ZANU-PF itself. If you look at the 2008 uh, violent election runoff, which is what uh, Bratton and Masunungure were referring to as the coup by steel, uh, the military was very active in terms of uh, uh, the Operation Makavotera Papi, you know, Operation Who Did You Vote For? And a lot of violence was committed under this operation with uh, uh, what they called uh, uh, the short sleeve and the long sleeve. Uh, some of the victims have got horrifying stories to tell. If you were given the short sleeve, it means your, your, your arm was cut from here. If you're given the long sleeve, it means your, your hand was severed from here. Um, and uh, a lot of studies have really pointed to the role of the state security agencies uh, in some of these uh, atrocious 
uh, acts of human rights violations. Um, as I argued, the GNU had potential for democratic transition. This was a political settlement negotiated under uh, Thabo Mbeki and Sadiq. Uh, but as I said, Mr. Mugabe kept control of the hard power cluster, so your defense and so forth. There was creation, not, not, not creation, but at least there was an act of parliament uh, which was then supposed to reconstitute what they called the National Security Council. And this was supposed to replace the Joint Operations Command to ensure that there is civilian control in terms of setting of, uh, 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 you know, security policies and security priorities for the country. The Prime Minister of the country, who was a creation of the, of the government of, uh, I mean, the government of national unity, was supposed to sit on the National Security Council. But what actually happened in reality is that uh, uh, the military generals and the other heads of state security agencies, uh, they said they were not going to sit with Mr. Changirai uh, in a National Security Council. He was a, a sellout, he was pushing a Western agenda, and therefore they were not going to recognize him. So the National Security Council never met, actually. They were supposed to meet at least once a month, but these guys just didn't show up wherever they were supposed to be meeting. But they continued to meet under the Joint Operations Command, clandestinely, and uh, making reports uh, directly to the president on security issues, obviously focusing on party political issues and targeting, uh, you know, opposition elements. There was a public denouncement of the GNU by the military. They made it very clear that uh, the government of national unit was unacceptable. Uh, this was a compromise by ZANU-PF. We needed to go to elections. ZANU-PF need to get out of the inclusive government and govern uh, 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 unilaterally. That in itself, I think it created the kind of attitude where there was resistance to reform, even by the government ministers and some of the permanent secretaries who were supposed to be working on in terms of uh, reforming state institutions. We even had the general being deployed to monitor uh, the constitution making process uh, to ensure that uh, uh, you know, the power dynamics would not result in um, uh, loss of authority. Uh, during the time of the inclusive government, the MDC was in control of the treasury. But, uh, you know, diamond revenues were never remitted to the state. The, the, the minister was on record uh, saying, uh, you know, the diamonds were not, the diamond revenues were not coming to treasury, but they were deployed to uh, certain key institutions, including the military itself, the party intelligence, and the party activities as well. If you look at the 2013 election campaign funding, it was very clear that. Uh, uh, ZANU PF was probably 10, 15 times ahead of the of the opposition in terms of its access to resources and campaign materials. Uh, you also had some of the key figures uh, coming from the state security uh, agencies, Henry Muchena, for instance, and Sidney Nyamene, actually going to the party and uh, taking full charge of the campaign strategies and the voter registration process, making sure that you know the opposition would not have access uh, to, to to registration centers, particularly in the urban centers. Uh, some of you might have already read about uh, some of those issues. There was also uh, the granting of mining concessions. As I mentioned, you know, those joint venture agreements with uh, Chinese companies. There was a $100 million loan agreement, for instance, between China and Zimbabwe, uh, in which uh, the Chinese have constructed uh, an elite military and intelligence training school in Zimbabwe, in Harare. Uh, no one knows the details of that loan. It's been kept a secret, but we know that... Uh, uh, it's being financed from some of the proceeds from the diamond mining sector. At the time that we had the inclusive government, the prime minister of the country was actually barred from visiting the diamond fields, and some of his ministers as well. Uh, they were told they were not welcome. Uh, there have been reports of illicit diamond sales uh, and the money not actually going to treasure. In 2012, a parliamentary portfolio committee on diamonds or on minerals uh, produced a report on the diamonds and really made the point that there was a lot of... Uh, corruption, illicit sales, and the looting of the diamonds. Uh, of course, you know, the chairperson of that committee, after presenting the report, you know, a few weeks later, he died in a car crash uh, in courts. Um, as I am speaking, the government is broke. They just presented a budget, but they are saying we actually don't have money. But we know that the diamonds are being sold. The money is not being put into, into treasury. Again, there have been reports of lavish spending by the political elite. Uh, two years ago, the Mail and Guardian, a newspaper in South Africa, produced a report uh, in which it said there had been millions of dollars being spent on uh, prime real estate in South Africa by some of the key figures uh, involved in, in diamond mining. 
I'll briefly talk about uh, possible scenarios going forward. I, I've just tried to demonstrate how the military has become entrenched in, in, in politics and uh, how that's going to present challenges in terms of uh, uh, democratic actors who are pushing for some kind of transition in Zimbabwe. Uh, but I know that many of you would be wondering, you know, what's going to happen going forward? What are the possible scenarios? And I thought I would put in a couple of slides just to look at what I consider to be possible scenarios going forward. I think that uh, scenario A uh, is probably continuity, which is a scenario where Mr. Mugabe, frail and old as he is, he remains alive and in power. But of course, the military tightens its grip uh, on the state and on the polity. Um, the pilage of natural resources would continue under this uh, scenario. International isolation uh, would persist and uh, economic and social collapse would be the order of the day, deepening poverty and citizen despondence. This would mean Zimbabwe becomes sort of, you know, the classic uh, failed state, if you like, joining, you know, the ranks of places like Somalia and other conflict uh, 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 you know, contexts. Uh, scenario B is that one of the possibility of a transition within ZANU-PF, uh, which transition would invariably affect uh, national politics. You know, given the strength of ZANU-PF as a political party, its liberation history, and its control of the state right now, I think that if Mr. Mugabe were to, uh, to be unable to continue either due to incapacitation or death, uh, ZANU-PF under the current constitution would choose a successor. And as I am speaking, the two front runners. Uh, Emerson Munangagwa and Joyce Mujuru, the current vice president. Both of them have got very strong, uh, you know, military roots. Mr. Munangagwa has been a minister of defense for a very long time. Uh, he comes from the sort of liberation war tradition and uh, considered a very, you know, strong man, if you like. Again, you know, VP Mujuru, also a decorated soldier. Uh, her husband was the first uh, uh, commander of uh, the Zimbabwe Defense Forces post-independence and a key figure, not only in the military, but even in, in Zimbabwean politics, because uh, uh, he actually sat in the ZANU-PF Central Committee at a time when he was serving as the commander of the, of the, of the Defense Forces. Um, so if we are to have this kind of transition, obviously it will be under a ZANU-PF rule. And uh, whether this actually brings in the kind of uh, international re-engagement that uh, many of us would hope for. Uh, I think that would depend on whether, uh, you know, any of these two characters actually changes tact and uh, takes a more conciliatory uh, uh, approach or attitude to uh, politics. Uh, scenario C is what I call possibility of a democratic transition. Under this scenario, there will be security sector reform. Uh, united opposition, you know, citizens really becoming active in terms of, you know, determining political processes, reform of state institutions, credible electoral process, international re-engagement, and the possibility of recovery and reconstruction. Uh, I'll talk briefly about uh, what the various actors could actually do to make sure that we have the kind of democratic transition that we would like to see, and in particular to ensure that the military plays its role uh, of defending the country and not defending regime uh, to ensure that there is, a, um, uh, you know, uh, open and free uh, political competition. I think that Zimbabwean actors, including civil society and other pro-democracy actors, should continue to lobby and advocate on. This might sound like a cliche, but I think that security sector reform is really going to be key uh, going forward. I think that uh, there is need to maintain uh, public information, knowledge, regionally and internationally on the diamond case, how the diamonds are being used to undermine democratic processes in Zimbabwe. I think that it's an area that has not been given sufficient uh, coverage, um, both locally and regionally. Um, I think that uh, democracy actors in Zimbabwe need to target strategically uh, when they are working with SADIC. I know that uh, 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 you know, people in Zimbabwe, some of them have sort of resigned themselves to say, SADIC is colluding with the regime in Harare to sort of trump uh, human rights and make sure that uh, you know, ZANU-PF uh, remains in power. But I know that uh, there are a lot of people in SADIC who care deeply about Zimbabwe and who would want to see the country moving forward. So I think that pro-democracy actors in Zimbabwe need to be uh, careful in terms of how they uh, deal with uh, some of the people in SADIC. And I think that the, to broaden the democratization agenda, dealing with issues of 
the role of the public media, for instance, you know, this is an area that still needs reform. Dealing with issues to do with uh, citizen participation in general. If you look at the new constitution, which is there, it's got an expanded bill of rights and all the good things that you would expect. But if you look at the situation, uh, I think that uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to ensure that citizens are given a voice and uh, civil society has a role to play in all of that. I think that uh, civil society can also play a role in terms of making sure that uh, uh, the Zimbabwean crisis uh, remains an international issue that people talk about. You know, today when people talk about hotspots globally, they will mention Syria, they will mention South Sudan, uh, you know, they will mention, you know, other places, but Zimbabwe has sort of fallen off the radar. And people are saying, well, that's an issue that's been dealt with. But, uh, you know, there are serious problems in that country. Um, and uh, there is need for international focus to remain on Zimbabwe. I think that regional actors like SADC and the AU, if they can focus on the full implementation of the new constitution, it's got some good clauses on limited terms for the heads of the security agencies. Uh, some of them, because they, you know, demographically, they're not going to be with us for long. Uh, if we ensure that uh, uh, the kind of attitude that they have been uh, you know, propagating amongst the, the, the other lower ranks of the security establishment. Uh, if those can be uh, taken care of, I think that there are opportunities for positive engagement with some of these uh, institutions. I know that the GPA has sort of lapsed in terms of, uh, you know, its, its, its currency as the, uh, the, the, the document that gave birth to the government of national units. But I think that the issues that were raised in the, in the, in the global political agreement, uh, they are still issues uh, that Zimbabweans are grappling with today. I mean, the global political agreement talked about security sector reform, it talked about media reforms, it talked about, you know, uh, reforming a lot of other institutions. And that spirit, I think, still needs to be maintained. And SADC has got a role to play in that. I also think that other liberation movements in the region have a role to play because uh, Zimbabwe, the liberation movement, will listen to other liberation movements, including SWAPO of, uh, uh, SWAPO of, of Namibia, including, uh, you know, Mkondo Esizwe of South Africa. Uh, this is the reason why in 2002, uh, Mr. Tabombeki dispatched a, a group of uh, army generals, retired army generals, to go to Zimbabwe at the time when we had a, a, a very violent election, because he knew that these people understood, uh, you know, what the military can do and what the military was doing. And I think that they scope for uh, some of these liberation movements, actually talking to the liberation movement in Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, for positive change. For international actors, you know, I have said this before and I'll say it again. I think there is need for a strategic rethink on sanctions. I think that uh, they have been used by the regime in Arai uh, to sway public opinion, not only in Zimbabwe, but even in the region, to portray themselves as a victim of an international conspiracy. And that in itself has resulted in a deepening of the culture of repression and authoritarianism and SADC and the AU have sort of chosen to pay a blind eye because they look at Mr. Mugabe as a victim. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, there is need to reconsider uh, whether those sanctions or smart sanctions are actually achieving the kind of objectives that people have said they want to achieve. Um, I think that there is still scope for supporting sustainable civil society initiatives that would help citizens gain the kind of confidence and knowledge to be, you know, active players in the processes that are happening in the country. I think that uh, international lobbying, again, on uh, uh, security sector reform needs to be maintained. But more importantly, working with SADC in the African Union, uh, I think international actors need to, to do that because uh, uh, these are going to be key uh, in terms of the political processes happening, not only in Zimbabwe, but even in the region. But I also think that uh, humanitarian support needs to be maintained. I have argued that uh, uh, you know, uh, the situation in Zimbabwe is very bad. I spent two weeks there uh, over the holidays and, uh, you know, poverty levels are increasing, people have lost jobs and uh, social services have deteriorated access to energy, electricity is always out, water is always out and uh, I think that there is need to continue supporting the people of Zimbabwe and making sure that uh, uh, no one starves and no one, you know, dies unnecessarily. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'll take an opportunity to answer questions.
Well, thank you very much, Charles, for that excellent presentation. We'll now hear from Eric Robinson. Thanks very much, Chris. And Charles, uh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, you spoke very quickly. Sometimes that's a sign of people being nervous, but uh, you were not nervous at all. Uh, you were speaking quickly so you could get through the vast amount of material, and you really showed your command of the subject. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, so in the interest of time, I may try and shorten my comments just a little bit. Um, I would also like to say that uh, I think you did a a very good job of keeping your uh, academic and political commentator hat on. Must have been very difficult for you, and for the most part did a very good job of keeping your MDC hat in the drawer. Um, you know, in your recommendations you talk about internationalizing uh, the situation in Zimbabwe. And uh, since our focus at the endowment of our grant making program is on civil society organizations, I see an opportunity for CSO uh, collaboration across borders, uh, perhaps in countries that are facing similar dynamics. Uh, the one that comes to mind is Uganda. Uh, the political and mil military movements in both countries have seen internal purges over the decades. You've seen the accretion of power uh, to those who struggled in the bush, and the memory of the bush as a way to keep, keep people in line. Uh, and also you see a significant involvement of the military or security forces in resource extraction, uh, certainly in Zimbabwe, and that's now uh, the case uh, more and more in Uganda with the discovery of oil in uh, the Albertine region in western Uganda. Also, when looking at uh, your work and discussion, uh, as time, time marches on, um, those who fought for independence are becoming fewer in Zimbabwe. And with this shift in demographics, the military will not have as a base of support uh, those who participate in the struggle. Uh, it will be necessary for the military to develop a new mechanism to pursue its enlightened self-interest, which of course should be the interest of all people in the country and its support of the Constitution. Uh, for me, this brings up two key questions. In what way can the military play a more constructive role? Uh, we talked a lot about some of the negative things uh, that may have occurred over the past uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, perhaps in a half glass full uh, look at it, uh, how, what would you comment on a constructive role? And also, is some of that positive role outlined in the new constitution uh, beyond what you mentioned uh, during your presentation? And while we're on the topic of the constitution, you have in your recommendations that it's regional actors that need to play a role in the full implementation of the constitution. Now, perhaps you excluded others um, internally because those are very obvious, but I think it's really worthwhile uh, as you continue to think about this, uh, move forward in your thinking on this issue, uh, to expand on what kind of internal roles can be played vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, Constitution, civil society, and other uh, domestic actors. I would also expand on the lack of... Uh, I wouldn't say expand. Uh, I wrote that comment yesterday when we did the run through of your initial presentation. You expanded a little bit on it uh, during this presentation. But um, uh, continue to look at and think about this the period of the JOC and the NSA as called for under the G GNU agreement. And uh, for me, this is a particularly uh, fascinating dynamic uh, in the lack of transition, uh, uh, transition did not take place. And for you, I know the focus has been, uh, here has been on one aspect of the security sector, the military. And you talk of the need for security sector reform. Expanding to the police and intelligence sector would have made our discussion a little bit too broad. Yet you have not mentioned the informal security sector, uh, the youth, who were formed into paramilitaries and who have played a very important role over the past decade or so. Perhaps you can say something briefly about the catalyst for an evolution of these non-state or quasi-state actors over the past decade or so. Also, as you do your follow-up thinking on this topic, uh, Chris and I both mentioned a book yesterday written by Admiral Dennis Blair titled The Military Engagement, uh, Influencing Armed Forces Worldwide to Support Democratic Transitions. Uh, this book has been, uh, was put out as part of the work being done by the Community of Democracies. And uh, Dr. Susilo Bambang, 
Yudhiana, President of the Republic of Indonesia, has some very good comments and insights uh, in the foreword of this book. We also recommend certainly um, uh, reaching out to a former NED fellow, Biram, Biram Diop, uh, from Senegal, who has done a significant amount of critical thinking on the role of the military and civil military relations as he's moved from the military to civil society and now back again to the military. And I think by reaching out to him, you could really uh, um, deepen your understanding of uh, what's happening on the continent. And uh, I think I'm going to stop it right there. I had a few more things to say, but we're running a little short on time and we have a lot of people in the room who have a lot of experience uh, with Zimbabwe and perhaps we can get to questions. Well, thank you for that, Eric. And uh, Charles, do you want to take a moment to comment on uh, parts of Eric's questions that he's raised, and then we can go to the audience for questions? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, in terms of the, the, demograph the demographic shift that you, that you mentioned, I need to emphasize that if you look at the, the, these security uh, sector institutions, and in particular the military, uh, what we have had in terms of the, the patronage system and the access to uh, the economic gains that I was referring to, this is something that has been happening within the top echelons. Mm. And if you go a rung or two lower, if you go uh, you know, down the, the chain of command, you realize that the, the, you know, there is a professional core uh, of people who want to do their job, who take pride in their, in their, in their role as, uh, as soldiers and uh, as people who are working even in the prison services. Uh, I've just been reading a very fascinating chapter that's been written by an Oxford scholar um, on, you know, she did a study on the Zimbabwean prison system and how the militarization or attempts to militarize uh, the prison system with people coming from the military and being given, uh, you know, uh, senior jobs in the, in, the, in, the, in the prison system actually caused a lot of, uh, uh, you know, disaffection by the professional uh, prison officers who just want to do their job. So they, they were fed up with the corruption and, uh, you know, the lack of professional conduct of some of the people who were imposed from the military. So I think that if you go, uh, you know, a couple of levels down, you realize that, uh, you know, there are people who are really committed to uh, doing their job in a professional way. And I think that's... Uh, that's the kind of, you know, uh, those are opportunities for positive engagement in terms of the positive role uh, that the military could play going forward. Um, I, I, did not talk ma I did not talk about, uh, uh, and, and thanks Eric for bringing that up, um, I think that there's been, uh, you know, the role of this sort of paramilitary, if you like, uh, uh, youth groups, uh, particularly, you know, after 2000, you saw the government putting in place uh, what they called the youth training programs, where supposedly uh, these youngsters are supposed to be trained on the history of the country, what role they can play in terms of developing, the, developing their nation. But in reality, what these training programs ended up being was that they were creating these, you know, sort of killer machines, if you like, who were then going into the villages and uh, terrorizing people. We used to call them the green bombers uh, because they wear green as their uniform. Um, their influence, I think, has sort of dissipated over the years because the government was failing. Because, to, I mean, because of the economic situation, the government was failing to maintain all of these institutions and making sure that they are functional. But really, they have become sort of they had become uh, a critical institution in terms of the military infrastructure uh, and the use of the violence by the state. Um, I think those are my initial. Yeah. So we'll take questions from uh, the audience, I'd kindly ask that you give your name and affiliation, and if you could keep uh, to one question each, that would be terrific. So if there are questions, why don't we start over here, and then we can come across the gentleman with the blue shirt. The microphone is coming. Uh, my name is Brooks Marmon. I'm with the American Council on Education, and thank you for the very um, comprehensive overview. Um, one, one situation percolating that hasn't gained a lot of attention is the conflict in Mozambique, which um, centers around the, the political party that uh, sort of historical enemies of ZANU-PF um, is near the border with Zimbabwe uh, in the eastern part of the country. And I'm just wondering, uh, to what extent do you perhaps see the Zimbabwe military getting involved in Mozambique, or even just um, 
that situation and the resurgence of conflict there strengthening the, the hand of the military and perhaps further hardening their positions? Okay, all right. Um, I think that historically, I think if you if you go back to um, uh, the period of the Rinamo, uh, you know, fights in Mozambique and the role that the Zimbabwean military uh, played in that country, um, there is a sense in which you know people in Harare, or at least authorities in Harare, feel that they have a responsibility uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the peace agreement or the peace process in Mozambique. Um, uh, you know, actually uh, uh, obtained. But there have been concerns. I think at the time that uh, uh, there was talk about uh, 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 Rinamo resuscitating uh, its, uh, uh, its activities, um, there were political statements that were made, there were political pronouncements that were made in Harare. And uh, it was very clear that uh, the government was saying uh, if the situation deteriorates, we will go back to Mozambique and we're going to be supporting uh, the government of Mozambique to ensure that uh, uh, there is the regional stability. I think that historically uh, this is a, a, a conflict which had a direct impact on uh, political processes in Zimbabwe and also the fact that uh, if you go to the uh, northeastern part of the country, uh, you know, a lot of people in Zimbabwe were actually affected by that, by that conflict. People were killed. Uh, in the area where I come from, for instance, in Mutoko, you know, raids by the, uh, 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 the, the, the Matanga outfit in Mozambique were very, were very common. So this is a conflict uh, that Zimbabwe has, you know, a direct interest in. And if the situation were to deteriorate, um, I think that, uh, you know, the government would not hesitate, in my view, to, to, be, to be, you know, to be sending uh, troops there to make sure that... Uh, uh, the peace process obtained. I mean, the you know the Zimbabwean the Zimbabwean government sort of uh, you know behaves as um, uh, if you particularly the because of its very strong uh, liberation movement credentials. You know, it sees itself as uh, uh, sort of the the unifier or at least uh, uh, you know the one with the responsibility to ensure that uh, militarily uh, there is uh, uh, the kind of stability. Uh, that uh, uh, many people will talk about. So, yeah, I think that there is a direct interest, and if it were uh, to come to that point, they would not hesitate to uh, send the military. And we have a question from Sally Blair. If we can bring the mic over. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sally Blair here at the NED. Charles, an excellent presentation. Thank you, Eric. Um, you mentioned about security sector reform as the key. And I wondered if you would elaborate a little bit more on some aspects and dimensions of that reform that you see as most important. And following up on this core of professional military, how would you energize them? How would you promote them somehow through your package of reforms so that they would you know, gain in strength or gain um, within the military? Thank you. Well, I think that the major the major concern for many democracy actors in Zimbabwe has been, you know, the kind of attitudes and political pronouncements that uh, the military has made, or at least some of the key figures in the military have made, uh, really drawing the line in the sand and saying we will support this political party and we will not support this political party. What men would have expected, and uh, there are institutions like Human Rights Watch, for instance, uh, who gave very good recommendations before we actually went to elections on what needed to be done in terms of security sector reform. They mentioned, of, for instance, that uh, there needed to be, uh, 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 you know, a process of ensuring that those that had been at the center of human rights violations and uh, causing, you know, the deaths and, and violence and things like that would actually be brought to book. That in itself would have been a very good starting point in terms of, you know, eradicating this culture of state-sponsored uh, violence and impunity. The other thing also is to, you know, just, just public pronouncements by the same people to say we will respect the constitution, we will respect the will of the people of Zimbabwe in terms of the electoral outcomes. We are not going to uh, stand in the way of what the people want. That in itself, you know, is going to be uh, 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 sending very strong uh, signals that this is a, a, a military that's adhering to its professional 
uh, you know, ethics and its professional conduct. Uh, there are also other elements that uh, have been proposed in terms of even including training programs for some of the uh, uh, you know, people in the security establishment to make sure that they understand their professional role and uh, ensuring that uh, you know, they, they, they look at defending national security and not defending regime security. Some of them don't even understand. I mean, if you look at the state security agents, for instance, there are, they are people there who think that their job is to protect ZANU-PF as a political party. They don't know that their job is to protect the national interest of the country. So the kind of trainings that uh, they would need to be exposed to. So, you know, there, there is quite a number of things that can be done practically. And uh, as I talked about, some of these people, the professional core in these institutions, those are some of the things that people ought to start thinking about in terms of professionalizing uh, the state security apparatus, I think. I just add that one of the uh, arguments that Dennis Blair makes is how to find a way to encourage uh, the military to see it in their interest to adhere to the uh, roles they should play according to the Constitution, but also to see in their interest uh, the benefits that would come from uh, democratically accountable procedures for themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's a, it's a challenge, but uh, if you understand that that's the objective, then you can map out ways to at least uh, think about how to get at that objective. Mm -hmm. We had a question from uh, the woman in the right on the center aisle there, and then we'll go to two others. Hi, my name is Julie Mancuso. Um, I'm with the Center for International Private Enterprise. We've actually been working in Zimbabwe with the National Chamber of Commerce and Women Entrepreneurs uh, through NED support. Um, you know, I'm just curious with your mention on the economy um, in terms of economic outlook every day. I'm reading more and worse news. I think today less sta state sponsored school fees and thus hundreds of thousands of youth that can no longer go to school because of their uh, reductions in the budget. And um, even with, the, I think they came out with a new five year economic strategy yeah. that is great in theory, but there's no money and there's no money seen as coming in as their reliance on imports is increasing and um, you know the, the failure of land reform aspects that have dried up crops and things. So in many ways, it just seems like people would sort of, um, that this would be hitting them hard, not even just in the those that were in poverty before deepening, but mm -hmm. I guess I'm wondering to what extent, how many people can be benefiting from sort of the corruption around diamonds and other areas that this isn't becoming of concern to that people are mobilizing around it, that even perhaps ZANU-PF supporters are now starting to rethink where their country's going and how it, their own families may not even be able to survive. Um, so I'm sort of just wondering kind of the attitude of people towards ZANU-PF, you know, and, and now they can't um, really blame the MDC anymore. And I know there's still blame on uh, Western sanctions, even though those really don't have a lot to do, or they're not actually hindering the economy much yeah. in any way. So, sort of, if maybe you could address some of those aspects. That'd be great. Thank you. Well, I think it would be difficult to, um, you know, <clears throat> maybe put a figure in terms of the percentage of people who actually have access to uh, some of the resources. But what's very clear is that the political elite. Uh, in Zimbabwe has been benefiting from the sort of, you know, crony uh, capitalism that we have seen. But a majority of the people are actually in poverty and they don't have access. And you are right that uh, even people in ZANU-PF, you know, so hardcore supporters of ZANU-PF are beginning to ask the hard questions. You know, what's happening to the diamonds? What's happening to uh, all these other natural resources that we are supposed to be having as a, as a country? And the problem is that uh, uh, you know, in terms of the economic vision that ZANU going to implement it, you know, bit by bit and sector by sector. 
but you have another minister at a different occasion saying we are going 100 percent we are taking over the banks we are taking over the mines we are taking over everything so the police inconsistencies that have been coming i think have been confusing for investors and i think you know that uh, capital is a coward as soon as people are not clear uh, you know, what's going to happen. They are going to be taking their money elsewhere. And there are a lot of other companies, I mean, countries uh, that are becoming attractive investment destinations for, for investors. South Africa, for instance, has taken the bigger chunk of uh, most of the investment that's coming in. So until there is clarity in terms of what this government is trying to do, uh, I think that it's going to be difficult. I, I, I feel sorry for, uh, you know, with, with all due respect to some of the people in the room who probably work in these embassies, you know, if you were to ask them today, what is the economic vision of Zimbabwe? What, what is it that we, you know, we are saying we are doing as a country? It's not clear. You know, on one hand, it's economic nationalism, it's indigenization, it's a strong position. On the other hand, you know, we're trying to, to lure the investors, come to Zimbabwe, you know, come and invest in our country. So until some of those broader, you know, macroeconomic policy issues have been dealt with, I think that we are going to be in this uh, economic country for a, for a long period of time. But as I said, you know, uh, in terms of the social services, you know, things are really getting bad. You know, water supplies, you know, you mentioned education in a few weeks' time. I think there is going to be a, 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 a very big crisis because the government work, government workers have indicated that they they need their salaries to be increased. I am not even sure that the government is going to be able to pay salaries as they are, not to increase them, but just to be able to pay them as they are. So that's going to create a lot of uh, tensions in the country, and my fear is that uh, the situation is sliding back to uh, what we had prior to the inclusive government. You know, the 2008. Uh, kind of situation. Of course, we might not have the kind of hyperinflation that we saw there, but the signs of the economic strains, I think, are beginning to show. And that's, you know, that's very worrying for a lot of people in the country. As I said, I spent two weeks uh, over the holidays. You know, there, there is some sense of hopelessness by many people. You know, where are we going as a country? And I think the national dialogue needs to shift to what can be done to make sure that the country moves forward but the options are very limited. In the absence of international re-engagement and access to uh, you know, credit, access to uh, the international support that's needed, I don't see how the government of Zimbabwe is going to be able to come out of this uh, crisis. I believe we had a question in the back. The gentleman, yeah. I was curious about the, the three... Uh, Could I kindly ask you to uh, introduce yourself? Stand up? Yeah, my name is Handel Melillo. I'm, just an, I'm here as an individual. And I was curious about the, um, the three scenarios that you put out. Uh, and I think scenario C had to do with uh, reforms of one kind or another. And I'm assuming that... <coughs> you are thinking that ZANU-PF is capable of making those uh, reforms. And uh, if you are, I'm assuming also that it will be after this man is gone, which could be any time. Are they capable of doing that? And knowing what has been going on over the last 30 years, how, what could they do? Um, I mean, these are, these are people in a corner and I'm not so sure that they could survive even the first attempt at reforming anything. And why don't we take uh, the question from the gentleman there as well. Hi, uh, Stephen Donaghy. Um, I used to work in Swaziland for six years in the progressive movement, and I had the opportunity to work on some issues around Zimbabwe as well. And after the 2008 political agreement, we expected, we knew it was a very flawed and imperfect agreement but it gave some stability to the nation. And I think those of us who were working around Southern Africa at the time expected that to be a platform for MDC to kick on and entrench and broaden their appeal and to be able to take the 2013 election much, much further. In your international, in your recommendations, you've talked an awful lot about external pressure to, bring, to be brought in Swaziland, but what sort of internal reforms and changes and lessons <coughs> need to be learned by the MDC and civil society? so that, that pressure can be translated into action. We've got way too much information and education, but not enough real political action on the ground. Thank you. Um, I think the question of whether ZANU-PF is capable of uh, 
you know, instituting some kind of reform uh, is very important. And I think you make a very good point that uh, without, or at least without Mr. Mugabe exiting the stage, it's going to be very difficult for ZANU-PF to reinvent itself and uh, to come across with a sort of progressive agenda of re-engagement, reform, and making sure that, uh, uh, you know, they change tact. But what's also very clear is that uh, uh, within the party itself, I think there is a sense in which um, uh, some of the key players can see that uh, this is not a sustainable route. And, you know, if you look at post this election, uh, with the new government coming in, of course, you know, there was recycling of the old brains in terms of the ministers that came in and so forth. But if you look at uh, some of the critical players in ZANU-PF, Jonathan Moyo, for instance, the current Minister of Information, there have been efforts to reach out to, you know, the media players, both state media players and private media players, and extending a hand to say, what can we do to move forward as a country? And for the first time as well, you know, post-election, uh, Minister Chinamasa, uh, before announcing the budget, and, uh, you know, he actually reached out to the business community uh, way before the government was, uh, a new government was put in place. He reached out to the business community and said, can you help us? What can we do? Can you please, you know, draft something for us that's going to move us forward? So I think that, you know, within the party itself, there are people who feel that uh, uh, they have to change strategy, but because Mr. Mugabe is very strong and he has taken a very hardline position mm -hmm. to say, you know, I will not negotiate with anyone, I will not talk to the West. And even when the ministers come here uh, to talk to the IMF and other possible funders, he, he doesn't comment on it. He, you know, he maintains he's bashing the same, uh, the same government. Uh, but I think that once he exits the stage, there is possibility of some kind of reform or at least engagement happening but you know there's still the possibility that even some of these uh, uh, people who are likely to take over from Mr. Mugabe, Mujuru for instance or Mnangagwa for instance, they could maintain the same kind of hardline stance but I think that uh, uh, they realize the folly of taking such a strategy because it hasn't taken them anywhere for 10 years, over 10 years actually they've been fighting everyone, they've been shouting at everyone, uh, the economy is bad, they have not been able to uh, move the country forward. Of course, they can blame the sanctions, and, and you know, which is why some of us are saying, you know what, uh, uh, call their bluff, you know, remove those restrictive measures and see what they are going to say, who are they going to be pointing fingers at? Because in reality, there are no sanctions. You know, Zimbabwe is still trading with, uh, with the European Union. Zimbabwe is still trading with the US government, still trading with Australia and all of these Western governments. So there are no sanctions to talk about. The fact that Mr. Mugabe cannot travel to Washington or London does that mean, you know, it's going to take the country back? I think that uh, uh, those are some of the dynamics that we ought to be uh, thinking about as we talk about possible scenarios uh, post Mr. Mugabe. Um, you know, the question of what, what can be done internally, I think that uh, uh, to maintain my, you know, academic head and keep my MDC head in the drawer, I, I think that, uh, you know, the period of the inclusive government was an opportunity, uh, you know, for the MDC and other democratic actors, democratic actors to really push uh, for reform. I think that uh, it was unstrategic for the MDC, for instance, to agree to go to an election in the absence of the critical reform that we needed to see, some of the things that I was talking about. But uh, um, uh, I think that going forward, uh, if the MDC is able to, you know, re-energize itself, give itself new impetus, uh, and, uh, you know, become the voice uh, of the progress that we want to see in Zimbabwe, I think that there is still a role that it can play in terms of it, you know. It's desperate to engage because they are desperate for cash, you know, they are desperate for money. They are willing to sit down and talking to people. So, you know, even uh, 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 some of the Western <coughs> governments will think that the door has been shut, you'll be surprised that um, they are willing to sit down and talking. And I think that we ought to be putting in place benchmarks to say, even if we are to remove some of these restrictions, what are the benchmarks that we are looking for? What are the things that we are looking for, the practical things that we can say, yes, that has been done. Uh, we, can, we can sort of easy on the, on the, on the, on the, on the screws that, are, that have been put on the regime. So there are practical things that can be done over the next four or five years before we can talk about an election in 2018. I think we have question, We have time for uh, maybe one more question. We had one here, and then we'll take the gentleman over here. So, Dean, why don't we? Yeah, Jeff. 
Yes, I'm Edward Sekamanya. I live in this area, but I'm Democratic Party for Uganda. And as Eric mentioned, we become a punchline. But my question to Mr. Charles Magungera is, you mentioned there are people who are talking reform. But we've seen it happen in Uganda. They talk reform and either they want to be rewarded by the president or whatever happens. <clears throat> so how do we know they are really on that thing? And then the other thing is, at which point do the people of Zimbabwe come out, an election is coming up maybe three, four years, and say enough is enough. I mean, talk about strengthening civil, civil societies, liberties. How, how is it, how do you see it, or how can it be done so that the people actually take charge? Because the military, I mean, they're getting the diamonds. Why would they ever do any kind of reform? Thanks. Why don't we take the, the other question here? Yeah, um, sorry, my name is Chibwe, and I'm with the Zimbabwe Embassy. I think Mr. Mangungera was trying to make reference to the presence of those from the Embassy. Yes, I am from the Embassy. Um, I, I just really wanted to make a few observations. And, uh, these observations relate probably to the last election that we had in Zimbabwe. You were addressing the issue of the military interfering in the you know, uh, political processes in Zimbabwe. I don't recall. Uh, when the elections were concluded, the MDCT attributing its failure to attain or to win the elections to, this, uh, to the military intervening in the political uh, processes, I, I don't recall that. In fact, I know they cited issues relating to the electoral, um, to the voters' row and those kind of things. They took the case to the um, uh, Constitutional Court, voluntarily withdrew the case, I assume probably they felt the, um, they didn't have quite a strong uh, uh, issue. That's just one to, to, to look at. Secondly, I just want to make an observation that relates to the participation of the um, MDCT in the last, well, the last six years when we started the process of negotiating the GPA, leading to their participation in government. I, I think five, six years is a long time for the MDCT to have made an impact in terms of addressing the issues that you raise um, lack of democracy i think you you, you you refer to a regime i don't know whether the regime is beginning 2013 or it begins 20, 2009 um they why uh, were they incapable of negotiating the um a one kind of winner win-win solution uh, where they <laughs> could not sit down with president mugabe to negotiate things that they felt needed to be addressed in a period of five, six years. Now, I, 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 I really don't want to uh, go into the narrative that you gave in terms of accounting for um, the, 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 I have heard that before um, in this room, several delegates have come from Zimbabwe, present cases more or less uh, in the line, same lines that you did. Um, you come here, people feel free to express themselves in the manner they do. I don't recall any of the people going back to Zimbabwe getting into prison because they are bashing the government left, right, and center. People freely come, express their views openly at international fora. I don't remember any retributions or anybody who has fallen victim because he has failed to express himself um, in, you know, democracy so requires that that, that be the case. I just want to make reference to uh, a number of other scenarios where um, the military governments are running elections. We, 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 we have not had um, the kind of voices that, uh, you know, right now, there are military governments conducting elections in some parts of Africa. Um, probably they have endeared themselves to certain powers. Uh, we, we have governments that have gone into foreign territories invaded countries, created instability to levels unimaginable. We don't hear that. We have had elections in Africa where several thousand of people have been killed. In Zimbabwe, the statistics that people quote about people... No, we can May I leave I, it at the point? Thank you. Thank you. So, Charles, do you want to sure. respond to those? 
Um, I think on the question of reform, um, you know, whether there is commitment to, to reform, um, I think that regimes, political regimes, um, can, you know, uh, reform if there is the kind of pressure uh, that is really, you know, that really forces them and gives them no space, uh, you know, to continue to be, you know, uh, violating people's rights. And um, I think that in Zimbabwe, at this particular juncture, um, there are things that can be done to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, the institutions of the state are actually functional. Uh, if you get the broader uh, uh, political questions, right? For instance, we have a new constitution, as I said, it's got an expanded bill of rights. You know, it talks about, uh, uh, you know, free political activity and all the things that you would want to see uh, in a democratic uh, political process. So the idea is, you know, the question is how do we ensure that this constitution becomes operational and the government of Zimbabwe is held accountable to say this is a constitution that you signed up to. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, it's functional. And I think that that's what civil society and other players need to be, uh, need to be doing. Uh, in as much as the regime might be, uh, you know, recalcitrant, might be resistant to uh, the kind of reform that we want to see, I think that once you get these institutions functional, of course there is a difference between having a constitution and the culture of constitutionalism, you know, respecting that constitution. But I think it's the kind of pressure that civil society can make. It's the kind of pressure that SADC and the African Union uh, can actually make to say, you know, you need to adhere to the constitution and making sure that uh, there is progress. Um, you know, whether the MDC raised the issues to do with the military in terms of the irregularities that were there uh, in the election, I have had the privilege of looking at the dossier that the MDC prepared and was going to hand over to the courts. Uh, I think that the issue of the role of uh, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission and the fact that it's still staff staffed by uh, people from the state security agencies, including intelligence and the military, you know, it's an issue which was raised in the, in the document that the MDC uh, said, this is the dossier of irregularities in this 2013 election. Um, I don't want to take the forum to sort of take a partisan uh, position. I've tried to give, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 an objective analysis of uh, the role of the military in Zimbabwe. But uh, if you want to know why the MDC withdrew its case from the courts, uh, I can explain in a few minutes. What happened is the MDC went to the courts and said, we have got a case of irregularities that we wish to bring to the attention of the courts. And therefore, uh, you know, we will be bringing in, we are willing to bring in witnesses. We are willing to bring in uh, affidavits of people who saw what happened in this election. People who were actually paid to do certain things. But uh, our lawyers were told by the judge that, okay, you have raised these issues. Uh, come to court on Monday. And uh, I'm going to be making a judgment on whether there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, admissibility of some of those affidavits and things like that. The party was left with no choice but to say, you know, we, we cannot come on Monday. We, we have to prepare for this case. Uh, that's exactly what happened. If you want to know why uh, the MDC never really took the route of, you know, going to the courts. Um, when he asked the question, the gentleman right at the back, you know, about the reform agenda and what the MDC could have done, uh, I was very clear that uh, I personally think that there are things that should have been done before the country went to elections. There was no full implementation of the global political agreement. There were issues that were raised by the global political agreement uh, that needed to be, to be implemented, but those were never implemented. And then you know about how the country went to an election. I mean, we were all not prepared for an election, including ZANU-PF itself, um, uh, to the point where, you know, we then it, it became a, a case at the courts you know, a citizen saying, I want the country to go to election. I think these are discussions that we can, you know, bilaterally have in terms of, you know, what actually transpired. But I think that the question is, uh, you know, all of us in this room are concerned about the future of the country. You know, we are concerned about uh, making sure that citizens have got access to, uh, you know, livelihoods, people have got access to income and people have got food on the table. Uh, I think that that's the most fundamental question that we need to be addressing in this room. And, um, you know, the point that I'm making is that in the absence of the democratic reform uh, that we would like to see, giving citizens a voice to participate effectively, 
there's no way we can talk about you know uh, Zimbabwe moving forward. And uh, you know, uh, if we are all concerned about the future of our country, those are some of the questions we ought to be addressing. I think. I know we're already. <laughs> We're, we're already past time. I know Eric has uh, an observation he wants to share on, on a point that was made. I'm glad you brought that up about uh, Uganda because some of the something was bubbling up in Julie's question and Stephen's question um, in, in terms of why aren't things happening. And you can look at Eritrea, for example. I, I think of it as faith and fear and some blend of it. And Eritrea is a good example where the people had such strong faith for decades in the struggle for independence in Eritrea. and it almost created a, this fog of cognitive dissidence uh, psychologically for the whole population. It's only beginning to clear in the last few years where they're beginning to see that the emperor has no clothes. In, in Uganda, the situation was when you go through Obote and Idi Amin, and then you have this relative period, even if it's the same person, change can be terrifying. Um, after, after many years of absolute terror in the countryside, you know, the devil you know who's not terrorizing your villages maybe isn't so bad. And in, in terms of the issues of uh, reform and action, uh, yes, some issues can be put on civil society, but you see time and again in, in Uganda, the uh, opposition seems to stumble and fumble in that final six months to a year before every election. And I would, I would posit that in Kenya and Zimbabwe this time around, the opposition uh, parties took a lot for granted and were perhaps resting in their, on their laurels in the run-up to these most recent elections. Well, if it's possible for a single presentation to be both um, a tour de horizon and a tour de force, mm -hmm. I think yours was that, Charles. Uh, it was really a clear-minded and insightful dissection of an issue that's um, very relevant in the Zimbabwean case, but I think it also is important for a number of other cases around the world that are struggling with how to encourage democratic reform uh, when military and security sector reform is lagging. So thank you very much both to you and to Eric for your comments, and thanks to all of you for your questions.